Christ is risen. Alleluia. A couple of days ago, I was reading USA Today, and I read a story um, an, about a children's Easter egg hunt in Macon, Georgia, that was being called off because of fears that moms and dads would become violent and trample on kids to grab eggs. Now, this isn't a vain fear because the organizers of the event said that last year several children got hurt. And, uh, and when people get hurt, they go to court. <laughs> so the organizers decided that they would no longer do this. It's not the first Easter egg hunt called off because of pushy parents. A free annual event held in Colorado Springs was canceled this year because, quote unquote, aggressive parents previously snatched too many eggs for their children. It's true. Organizers said that uh, some parents were too aggressive, leaving some children empty handed. You know, when you read these stories, it's just, it's nothing like a, a good old fashioned street fight to. <laughs> Teach children the true meaning of Easter. I think that's a good example of just how disordered our world has become. When something as sweet and something as innocent and as wholesome as a children's Easter egg hunt can become an occasion of greed and aggression. The evidence is mounting that the world is in trouble. As a pastor, I talk to people from time to time who relate to me the burdens that they are bearing. And I find that a lot of people feel as if they are beaten up or that they are about to be overwhelmed. And they sometimes express that they are losing hope. Now you can go about 40 days, I think, without food. And you can go maybe 10 days without water. And maybe you can go four or five minutes without air, but you cannot exist without hope. If your constant state of mind, if your default setting is discouragement and being afraid you won't last. So let me ask you a very personal question on this beautiful morning, on this Easter morning. On what are you basing your hope? In a gathering of this size, I have no doubt that some of you came in here today feeling hopeless about some area of your life. I'm never going to get out of debt, you might say. You're feeling hopeless about your finances. I'm never going to get married. When are we going to be able to have a baby? I'm never going to reach my dream. I'm never going to see this problem resolved. I'm never going to feel any better. And you feel hopeless in some area, some aspect of your life. And there are some of you, I'm sure, who have even felt like throwing in the towel. But don't do it. God's love for you is bigger and stronger than any of the problems that you are facing right now. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the basis for our hope. Because we know that evil will not have the final word. One day a man walked up to Jesus and asked him, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the Bible? And Jesus said, To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Your reason for getting up in the morning, ultimately, what is it? When you sit on your bed, contemplating your day, thinking about putting on your socks, what is going through your mind? Your reason for living, ultimately, 
is to receive God's love and to love Him in return by loving one another. And this meaning, this significance to your life gives you direction each day. If anyone ever asks you what is the meaning of life, you can tell them to be loved by God and to love Him in return by serving my neighbor. Listen to me. It doesn't matter how many deals you close, how many sales you make, how many achievements you rack up, or how many awards you win, at the end of the day, if you have forgotten that you are loved by God and love Him in return, you have wasted that day. And that day for you is a failure. Why? Because God did not put you on this earth just to mark off things on your to-do list or your bucket list. That's a pretty shallow way to live, even if those are very good things to do. God did not put you on earth just to get up in the morning, go to work, come home, watch TV, go to bed, and party on the weekend. He created you first and foremost so that you might receive His love and that you might love Him in return by serving one another. He created you first and foremost to prepare you to spend forever with Him and eternity with Him. So if your relationship with God is not your top priority of your life today, if it is not the most important agenda item on your day planner, you might be missing the point. And the tragedy is that there are so many people who are living their lives and even to external appearances doing so successfully, but they are missing that point. That they are loved by God and He calls on us to love Him in return by serving our neighbor. People know all kinds of other things. They know the stock quotes, the sports scores, the top ten, who's on the cover of People magazine. But they might not know God. And they might not know that His purpose for them is to receive His love and to love Him in return by serving one another. And that's a tragedy. But think about yourself. How do you know when your relationship with God needs attention? I'm going to tell you. There is a warning light that comes on in the dashboard of your life when you are disconnected from the Lord or when your relationship with your Creator needs your attention. And that little warning light is called stress. Any of you familiar with that term? Stress? So. Worry. The hand wringing. That's the warning light that at that moment in your life you are not connected with your Father. See, whenever I'm worrying, whenever I'm wringing my hands, that says, I, I think it's all on me. Whenever I'm worrying, that's me acting like God, like everything depends on me to make things work out. I'm pretending that I'm the general manager of the universe, that I've got to make it all happen, and that God isn't going to take care of me. That's what causes stress. And one of the reasons that you're tired all the time, one of the reasons that you're fatigued or stressed out might be that you're trying to live your life on your own strength. Jesus said, come to me, you who are weary and heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. Well, I started out talking about Easter egg hunts and uh, how they have apparently uh, sometimes in some places uh, turned into uh, common brawls. You can't look around for very long without seeing the evidence of hatred, of bigotry, of greed, of selfishness. And you don't have to read the newspaper and you don't have to look at the people next to you. You just have to look in the mirror. You know who your biggest obstacle is? Your biggest problem? It's not some other guy. 
It's the man in the mirror. Yes, there are wars. Yes, there is crime. Yes, there is domestic violence. And all of these things are deplorable. But even if those things don't touch you directly, every one of us has the problem of living for and looking out for Mr. Number One. So I think that uh, as beautiful as this day is and as beautiful as this world is, which God has so generously given to us, I think that we have a problem. What we need now, what I think that this world needs, is, you might say, a regime change. We need a regime change because the world has been existing for far too long under the iron fist of death. For far too long. It was a uh, early morning when my phone rang. I was 17 years old. And um, I, I lifted up the phone, and, and it was my sister-in-law saying, Sean isn't breathing. Now, Sean was my 18-month-old nephew. So I hopped into my baby blue Pinto. <laughs> That's what I drove. And uh, fled up the interstate to uh, North Kansas City to the hospital. My brother was working construction at the time and uh, they hadn't been able to reach him yet. And uh, uh, a policeman pulled me over. A motorcycle cop pulled me over for speeding. And, um, and like I said, I was 17 in my hot rod. <laughs> so, you know, they, they pro he profiled me right away. This is a crime. But uh, he said, so I explained to him that uh, I was rushing to the hospital because my 18-month-old nephew was, was, had stopped breathing. And uh, good soul that he was, is, I hope, he didn't give me a ticket and, in fact, gave me an escort. And I don't think he blew a siren, but he did go ahead of me and let me go fast. And I got there, and I walked in, and the chaplain was waiting for me. And um, I was the only family, I was the first of the family to arrive. And uh, the chaplain asked me if, you know, I was there for Sean. And uh, I said yes, and so he took me into a room. Some of you have been in this room, where on a, on a table, was lying my, my nephew in his little fuzzy pajamas with the feet. And he was quite dead. Sudden infant death syndrome. Death is a bully. It is not a respecter of persons. The evidence of death's cruelty is all around us and affects each and every one of us and touches all of us. But listen, I want you to know on this Easter morning that God in heaven hates death even more than you do. And he sent Jesus into the world to do battle and overthrow that dictator. Now the battle still rages, but the victory is assured. And there will come a day for each one of us when we will, like Jesus Christ, personally overcome death and step from our graves. And it's not just about the 70 or 80 or 90 plus years, if you're blessed, that we live in this world. As Christians, we look forward to a glorious future, a bright day where the sun never sets. And it says in 1 Corinthians 15, a text that is read at most Christian funerals, at least 
um, in my experience, where St. Paul says, we will all be changed in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. Change you can believe in. Our bodies here and now are subject to weakness and disease and injury and decay. But on the day of your resurrection, that glorious Easter to come, your body will be glorified and your soul and your mind will be pure and you will be transformed like Christ never to experience suffering or pain or death again. Death will die. And I will dance on its grave. And you will be perfect. The best you imaginable forever. They say that every so often, you know, your, your individual cells of your body are, are dying and being replaced by new cells. And, and I forget how often, but every so many years, uh, your entire, uh, all of the cells of your body have probably been replaced so that you're kind of practically a brand new you every, every five or six years. I figure that I'm probably working on uh, Scott Stigmeyer 5.0 by about now. You know, in software, we, in computers, we have to upgrade and update programs because they become obsolete. Well, God is in the process of upgrading you, body and spirit. And I'm looking forward to that day because on that day, the Lord Jesus is going to wipe the tears from my eyes. He's going to call me by name. He's going to show me to my heavenly estate. And he's going to do the same thing for you. And on that day, everything bad that has ever happened to you will be forgotten. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the peace which passes understanding keep your hearts and minds in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Please rise to confess our faith.